I'll, um, I'll introduce Dr. Jinha Jung from Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Jung will visit with us about in-season cotton growth uh, prediction using UAS data and machine learning. Uh, Dr. Jinha, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my great honor to have a chance to share you know, our research and our progress in this meeting. And before I start my presentation, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, you know, these duos from Purdue, myself and Akash is my PhD student. And I'm going to call the trio from you know, Texas and Eagle Life, you know, Dr. Landivar, AJ, and Murillo. Okay. Before I start the uh, you know, presentation, I think I've been uh, citing this um, you know, literature you know, quite a number of times in you know, cotton meetings so far. And I want to introduce the paper that was published in 1960s by using Wagner, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in Natural Science. So basically what it does is that, uh, you know, there is very complicated phenomenon out there, but the beauty of this mathematics is you can express those complicated phenomena in a very, very simple form. And I think that was you know, very interesting, but uh, another interesting paper that just came out is uh, 2009, 2009 from in the Halevi, I think he is working for Microsoft, and uh, the title you can look at, it is very similar. Only difference is the unreasonable effectiveness of data, not the mathematics. And uh, one of these, um, you know, text in this in a paper is in a fairly simple machine learning algorithm performs almost identically well on the complex problem of natural language disambiguation once they are given enough data. And uh, actual in a graph that is in the paper, and this x axis is the number of you know word you know, used to train the model, and uh, this is in you know, a target accuracy. I'm gonna say that this blue one is going to be simplest one. You can see that you know this performs worse, but once in you know, a enough number of training that is given to the simple model, it almost you know outperforms or you know performs as well as in you know, other complicated algorithms out there. So I think that there is in the video of this paper, and I think Dr. Landy already you know talked about this um, you know data collection mode. You know the big assumption here is you know once we have enough number of data, we should be able to do a good job. In 1990s, you know, this is actual example of you know, Dr. Landbar working in the field using yardsticks, using a GPS backpack, you know, to measure canopy height. This is working and this is you know, accurate, but it takes days you know, to cover in a large area. And even with days in the hard work in the field, you're going to only have a limited sampling. So you know, in the early 2000s, you know, the people start to, you know, looking at this in you know, a ground platform where because you're going to be in you know, at the driving this you know, tractor over the field anyway. So why don't you just mount in you know, a sensor? You see this GPS over here. They sometimes have you know, green seekers so they can get the you know, spectral signatures, you know, mount the you know, device to measure the height and etc. So this is you know, a great improvement for this one. You know, instead of days, you may be covered the area in hours, but uh, it's not still continuous coverage. You're just going to be sampling few spots in the field. So you know, later in 2015, this UAB comes in, you know, the large area can be covered in minutes, I'm going to say, and uh, this in view of this is that now you're covering whole area without any gaps and you're doing a continuous sampling. If you look at the result, you know, this is a uh, you know, few samples and interpolation, this is how it looks like, you know, we have uh, more samples to interpolate, so it looks a little bit smoother, but you have a UAB, basically you're covering whole area without any gaps, there's this beauty of it. And uh, this is uh, you know, the quote from uh, former Intel CEO Brian, and I think you've probably heard this in the term before in fourth industrial revolution, and the key phrase is that here is that data is the new oil. Like you know, it changed the world in 1900s, you know, through cars, through, you know, whole chemical industry. He believes data, I look at as a new oil, is going to change most industry across the board. So I think that this is happening right now. But I believe this you know, UAV is going to be the one that is going to actually you know, make it possible to collect data in you know, a big scale for agriculture application. And uh, one of these you know, eye-opening examples that uh, while we are working on this UAV-based high-tube phenotyping is you know, this experiment that I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, we have uh, conventional tillage versus no tillage you know, the, you know, management practices to see how much impact those uh, management practice we will have for the you know, final ill. This is a, a field in Corpus Christi that has been in a till for in the last 10 years, in a no-till for the last 10 years. And uh, you see that in you know, the same varieties in you know, planted and in full UAB, we're just extracting different, you know, the phenotype information out of this field. 
and uh, this is the actual yield at the end of season you know the machine harvested does in the first pair you see that you know the no-till has in a higher yield second pair there is pretty much no difference at all in third pair we have a huge difference over there in the fourth pair we have a huge difference over here if you just average them all you know you can see that you know no till has in a higher than competition of till is but if you just do the you know statistical analysis you know it turns out to be that they are not significant because you have a very limited number of samples to you know to do the statistical analysis so when you actually you know go out to the same field collect the canopy height measurement manually you see that uh, in a blue line here is no tail and the origin line is in a manual tail I mean that sorry that conventional tillage you see that you know for the first pair you don't see that much of difference in terms of height second pair you don't see third pair you don't see any of those in you know, the difference early in the season but the late in the season you can see you know the no tillage is actually a little bit over time and the fourth pair is more you know the you know the clear you know that case but uh, a lot of times it's very hard to conclude that you know no tillage is in a better than conventional i mean the conventional tillage is better than you know no till i mean sorry no tillage is better than conventional tillage but if you fly this region with the uabs and the measure the canopy height measurements you see that in a very consistent you know the match with the in you know, actual harvest yield first pair you know no till is higher second pair pretty much the same third pair you know no till is high and the fourth pair no till is high so you know this kind of give us a kind of in a confidence that the UAB is doing a pretty good job in terms of capturing actual some of the you know, phenotypic information out of it. So out of this in experience, what we actually you know, the came up with in you know, hypothesis is that, that we should be able to predict cotton growth in season even with a simple model when we have an enough number of training data. So the problem statement that we are trying to achieve over here is that the, we have a you know, cotton field you know we are flying this in you know, a field with the UAB so that we can actually get it in you know this is example of you know, canopy cover here you know canopy cover quantify you know throughout the season and then now we are at day 50 can we actually predict how this you know cotton is going to grow in the rest of the season and the sum of those you know, attributes that we consider here is you know, cannot be high volume cover and excess greenness index. The reason why I pick four is because this is the information that you can extract from the RGB UAB data, I mean UAB platform, which is you know, fairly cheap you know, these days. So this is data that we work with. We've been working with uh, you know, historically collected uh, you know, cotton UAB data over in you know, Corpus Christi in a study in 2016. All day to 19 we are still working on uh wrapping uh summarizing 2020 so we're going to be adding those you know data in the analysis you know, later for this reason we are going to deriving you know the drawing those you know the meter square polygon i mean the grid over there and the number of you know grid that is available for the analysis for 2016 was about in you know, 8000 2017 we only for the small area so we only have about a little bit of a thousand 18 we have a 9000 in 2019 we have a 12000 you know data samples you know that basically you know capture the you know growth over the you know the cotton of the whole growing season and uh, i can just claim that, that this is going to be enough data to you know the you know of the model and uh, i need to go back to that in you know, the hypothesis you know, again that we have enough data that we need to come up with a simple model and the simple model we come up with is in you know, a k nearest you know, k neighbor algorithm this is non parametric algorithm and simply what they do is you know new samples coming they want to predict they're trying to find k closest samples from the training data set and using those you know the k closest samples to predict what is going to happen in the future and the problem with that you know approach here is that the total is you know every year we are collecting UAV data in different time of year i mean time in a day of the day of the year also you know planting date is different so we need to have some kind of way of you know the you know putting them in the same you know time frame so what we use is in a day is the planting so you know after you know first you plant it then the cotton on the ground that becomes you know first day after planting and just you know keep doing it so this is an example in 2016 UAB data said well let's collect in 27 days after planting 36 almost on a weekly basis 17 we start flying 13 days of planting you know 18 in uh, the eight, 11 days of floor planting and, and etc. So if you just use this time window instead of in you know, actual in you know, a day of the year, we are going to be using the same window. And uh, this is an example how we are doing here. 
this is an example of in a case of all new year using up to 30 days this is a uh, in a red line here is going to be um, you know predicted and green line is going to be actual and uh, this right part is not shown to the model yet and all those in you know, the measurement from the UAB before this in you know, a date they go into the database try to find the K news neighbor from the database to look similar to this in you know, a sample over there and that they're going to try to predict in you know, all those gray line here is the you know, the three you know, nearest samples that is found from the database you just you know, average them they're going to predict this in you know, a growth in the rest of the season so you know with this you know we're going to say that this is a simple enough there is mathematically nothing complicated in you know, a very very simple but uh, this is a you know, data driven and uh, we just you know the hoping that we can this kind of simple model can predict you know work pretty good to predict in season growth uh, for the cotton field. So this is an example of you know, the 2016 as a training data set and the trying to predict growth for you know, 2017 uh, cotton. And when we used first 40 days of UAV data from 2017 and tried to predict uh, what a week ahead of you know, growth, and that this is uh, in a mean you know mean scale error which says that you're gonna you can expect about three centimeter error to predict you know one week growth if you want to predict you know the two week you know ahead it's going to be four centimeter three week ahead is going to be five four week ahead is going to be about you know five centimeters so as you're trying to predict you know far away you know error you know the increase that's you know, the obvious but uh, in a three centimeter you know a week ahead in prediction looks in you know, a pretty reasonable or you know the good enough and uh, they have uh, another direction over here as we are adding more date into this in you know, a training you can see that you know that when we are using only first 40 days to predict a week ahead is about three centimeter error if you just you know use almost in you know, 80 days of data and predict one week ahead is going to actually you know give you only two centimeter error so as you're moving this direction error increase as you're moving in this direction error decrease and uh, this is the uh, same table you know shown in a graph over here you can see that this blue one is a week predict you know a week ahead prediction orange one is two week prediction and a gray one is three weeks and the yellow one is four weeks ahead as you move you know the use more data into the you know the, to, into the prediction this you know error in a decrease but the, if you want to predict you know, farther away error increasing over there and uh, this is example of you know using 2016 and 17 as a training and trying to predict you know 18. I'm not going to go over the numbers. You see that in you know, a pretty similar patterns over there. Error increase we you know as we try to predict in a farther way, but uh, as we have more data set in general, those in you know, error decreasing over there. And this is example when we have you know the three years of data as a training and try to predict the growth in 2019, and we are seeing pretty much the same pattern. But the only thing is that the actual you know, actual error for the you know, first four days, you know, if you just look at this one here, you know, 2.8 centimeter, going back to slide back, this was 3.3 centimeter. So as yes, we have more data in the database, that prediction is also increasing, I mean, the, the getting better as well. And uh, we also did the, uh, you know, kind of volume, pretty much the same pattern. And uh, this is an uh, example of, you know, 16 as a training, uh, 17 for prediction. 16, 17 training, 18 prediction, and at the, use everything else predict, you know, for training and the 2019 as in a prediction. And the uh, same thing for the canopy cover, the same thing for the excessive greenness index, and we're happy to see that. So with this, you know, where, you know, which direction we are going, and uh, that was the example that we showed uh, for the, you know, research plot. But what we believe here is that, that this should be also, you know, useful for the, you know, growers as well. And that this is a, uh, actual one of the field in you know, a drill school in South Texas that we've been uh, collecting UAB data for in the last two years and that uh, this in upper area here is actual UAB images and the bottom here is canopy cover you know calculate from these UAB images you know colored as in you know, a red means in you know, a zero in you know, a canopy cover you know dark green is a like, hundred percent canopy cover this is in you know, at uh, um, March 21st right after planting about two weeks later, you see that, you know, start to, you know, to germinate and you just, you know, keep going. Let's say, you know, this is about a little bit more than a month after planting. And imagine that you are the farmer and that this is, you know, how your food in the field look like. And uh, with some, you know, the, you know, season prediction model, imagine that you can actually predict, you know, how your field is going to look like in a month after. 
And with this kind of information in hand, uh, there should be a lot of you know the decisions that you should be able to make it at this moment. And uh, this is an actual you know UAB images collected from the UABs you know coming back over here. And see that this is a I mean this is not a actual I and mean, this you know I'm just kind of making a you know story out of it. But uh, you can just think of this as that you can just see the future. You know you should be able to make a decision you know fairly uh, you know smart. And uh, those are the one direction that we are going. And we're also trying to actually use in you know, the satellite data, like in Dr. Land mentioned, so that we can just uh, do similar things for the location where we are not collecting your data set. And eventually, either all this information is going to go to the simulation model or in you know, a data driven AI model so that we can do the you know, prescriptive you know, incision management and yield estimation for the future. So, with that, I'm going to end my presentation. And uh, we'll have to uh, answer any question you might have. Thank you, Dr. Jinha. Do we have any questions for Jinha? Hey, Murilo, I have a question. This is Moto. Hey, okay. nice presentation, Jinha. Thank good. you for that. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned about drones, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what is your opinion about ground robots? I mean, of course, you know, the ground robot will give you, uh, you know, the more accurate and the high resolution images. And uh, one of the challenges that I'm going to see is that, uh, you know, the coverage, you know, special coverage you might have. So, and the other, another kind of issues that I can also see is that, um, you know, the, a lot of this UAB, advantage with this UAB is that uh, when you're collecting the data, there's a lot of redundancy that you can use to actually correct some of the errors in terms of you know locating your measurement but the ground robot they're going to be mainly you know relying on gps and a lot of times gps can be hindered by you know the upper canopy you know for especially you know tall you know canopies as well so i think that there might be another advantage of um you know uavs so i, I mean i I'm not against the you know ground robot. I think that there is uh, you know of course you know pros and cons for two different platform, but uh, you know within at least in our group you know that's in our research focus area, because you know you can have you know continuous coverage for the whole field in a very reasonable time window. Okay, so you mainly focus on drones. Yes. Rather than ground mm -hmm. robots. Thank you. Have any uh, other questions or comments for Dina? Just a comment, you know, that, that you, saw where we, you saw where we're going, you know, and being able, you know, to take uh, whatever data we have collected to a certain point in the season, you know, and then take the grower, you know, for the next 10, 20, 30 days, you know, so he can see what his crop looks like, you know, so he can make management decisions and whatever, growth regulators, uh, you know, water, watering and so on, uh, and, um, and be able to, uh, you know, to be... Uh, proactive on his, uh, on his uh, management. But an another point is that, uh, you know, it gets to a certain point in the season, uh, and, uh, and I will let Jinha comment on this, which is around 40, 50 days, you know, where you can very comfortably, you know, forecast uh, the rest of the season, you know, with a, with a reasonable error. Of course, it gets better as you get more data. But more important is that uh, around that time, you know, especially if you if you link with simulation models and so on, you know, it's the time where you can forecast a yield. So in you know, in about 40, 50 days, you know, you can have, get a a, a, a a you know a prediction of yield. You know, and you, and you just imagine, you know, what you can do with uh, you know, with accurate yield forecasting, you know, for the whole Nueces County or for you know, we think that we can do the whole state of Texas. You know, uh, at uh, forty days after planting, you know, for marketing for you know, for planning, for management, and so on. So the, the, uh, the Jinha, you want to comment on that? Uh, on, on that work? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, uh, not exactly uh, the in continuation of the you know your comment, but the one thing that I want to point out here is the work that we present is in data driven and also in location specific. So all those in you know, the training data that you know, is collected in Corpus Christi, and uh, you know that database is, is not going to be useful for you know, for example, Lava because you know they're so different. And uh, you know their growth pattern is going to be different, but the beauty of this is that uh, you don't need to collect any other data sets. So you don't need to know. You know we are not even using any weather data. We are not using any soil data set or any you know irrigation or you know variety information. Nothing is given. This is you know, solely based on you know growth pattern that was detected from UAB. Can you actually predict in you know, a future growth you know based on that? 
So I think that is in you know, the beauty of you know this approach that we're doing. But there is still you know a lot of improvement that we can make. You know we can incorporate weather information, for example, soil data, any other kind of the information that might you know the, couple with the, this current approach to make the prediction more accurate. Uh, Jin Ha, the James Mahan here in Lubbock. Just mm -hmm. a real quick question. One of the things I see everybody hanging on a drone now is a thermal sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I don't think you had any thermal data in anything you showed. What are your rough thoughts on the value added by a thermal sensor to phenotyping? Uh, I think that there is going to be great addition for sure. But the challenges that I'm uh, you know, the encountering right now is uh, I mean, the difficulties of you know, collecting data because the you know, thermal is so prone to you know, the other noises like in you know, wind in a time of the day, also even during the in a data acquisition, those temperature changes. So uh, I think there is one time we trying to establish these thermal sensors as a, one of our data sets that we collect, but uh, we had we are seeing so much opportunities from other sensors like an RGB and multispectral. So we've been focusing on that, but I'm I I, I I'm confident that that is going to be I'm going to say that the biggest you know, addition that we can add. If you can have you know reliable thermal measurement you know from UAB for this kind of work, I think you're I think you're probably correct there. You you had a slide earlier where you were showing mm -hmm. drone data as being continuous, and what's important to understand there in certain physiological situations, it is continuous spatially, mm -hmm. but it is not continuous temporally. That's exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think that's what you're sort of alluding to. And I wondered if you've just done any of that, because as you've said, uh, over a reasonable length drone flight, canopy temperature can change significantly. And uh, I think you could approach it with a different paradigm. But uh, it's that difference between continuous spatial and continuous temporal. And the trick of understanding those those are not always the case for all plant parameters. Certainly high canopy cover changes on the order of, of hours or mm -hmm. days. Uh, the others change on the order of minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank, thank you, James. Uh, Dr. Baldensberger, I saw that you had a, a raised hand there. I don't know if you were trying to um, ask a question or make a comment. I was just going to say, great job. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Jinha. Uh, so, so, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next. Murilo, Murilo, before you go on, you know, we just want to make a comment. You know that uh, I think it was very, very evident. You know, and the uh, and the uh, way that uh, you know the, the synergy that I made, You know, by working with uh, engineers and computer scientists like you know the group of uh, of Jinha and AJ and Akash and so on and. Uh, and that is, you know, that the, the concept of this uh, uh, prescriptive uh, in-season management, and uh, you know, it, that's 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 our job. That's the agronomist, you know, that uh, you know that uh, tell the uh, the engineers, you know, that uh, this is what we would like to do, you know, that uh, we would like to you know to get the data to that point and then forecast, you know, what you know what we can do, you know. But uh, the beauty is that uh, you know that the engineers get together, you know, and come out with you know with the best way of collecting the data. The best way of analyzing the data, uh, uh, you know, and come, uh, coming out with these models, you know, that fit uh, us, you know. I don't have to worry about uh, learning all, all of those, uh, not capable either, you know, to learning all of those computer models and, and approaches, you know, to data analysis, you know. So, so uh, you know, that, that's what I meant by, by, by the slide that I have, you know, where the, uh, where the my first slide, is that the synergy created by uh, transdisciplinary work is, uh, is so powerful. And uh, I think uh, the presentation of uh, Gene had made it very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lanivar. And uh, you know, I'll just I'll just comment that I agree 100% with you. Just you know, from previous conversations, I think you know our, our our group hadn't seen anything that has paid as much dividends as you know having having this interaction with um, other groups and, and other people with different backgrounds. Um, you know, definitely what we found out is that, at least for the engineers, as long as, as you as a biologist can frame the question uh, the correct way, they, they more often than not, they have, a, they have an answer for it. So 